a lot of years ago, about 30 odd years ago, um, Barb and I were relatively new in ministry and um, we had started as youth pastors and um, and then assistant pastors and we'd only been saved about five or six years. And when I was doing a bit of study one night, the Lord called me quite, quite clearly from Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 4 to 10, which has since been confirmed by others senior ministry. Over the years from about 99, 2000 to 2010 or 11, it became a progressive unfolding pretty much for each verse. Uh, so in ministry, it was kind of like I, I traveled quite a lot in South America, Africa, Asia, and so on. And to be quite honest, when I, I really felt the Lord call me out of those verses, I read them several times, was reasonably impressed, but didn't have a clue. Um, it was, wow, what the heck does that mean? Um, yeah, you can read it, but you say, okay, well, I can read it, but what does it look like in real life? I mean, how does this work? How does this unfold in practice? And over the years from about 2000 to 2010, um, everything pretty much up until uh, verse 9 kind of unfolded in ministry over those 10 or 11 years. Always wondered about verse 10, because verse 10 says, See this day I've set you over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out, to pull down, to destroy, to throw down, to build and to plant. And quite honestly, I thought, well, that sounds fairly impressive, but quite frankly, I haven't got a clue what it actually looks like or what it's supposed to mean. Um, I found out this truth <laughs> um, in, in more ways than one. In Ephesians 6.12, it says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but principalities, powers, and rulers of darkness. And the Lord began to speak to me fairly clearly in the weeks prior to going to Uganda about those verses. But let me say from my perspective, and I hugely appreciate the amount of prayer and people uh, that were praying for me because I, I sort of stepped into some territory that I've never done in ministry before and uh, went hard and went into a bit of spiritual head buddy. Um, <laughs> Ephesians 6.12 doesn't say the wrestling is optional. It says we wrestle, period. So we are in a spiritual war, whether we like it or not, believe it or not, want it or not, uh, we're in it. My attitude, and you may disagree with me, this is just me personally, the day that the fear of the blowback overrides the anticipation of victory, we've already lost. The day the fear of the blowback overrides the anticipation of victory, we've already lost. Um, that's just me. However, having said that, I wouldn't necessarily recommend you go too hard into it without some direction and revelation and specific calling. Um, I did do, do I mean, I, I felt I went with the specific direction and calling. Uh, I went as an ambassador of the kingdom. I went with prophetic apostolic authority. Uh, I went sent by the King of Kings and invited into the country by a recognized apostolic ministry. So, and, and also with Suzette's covering and blessing. So I did it um, every correct way that, that, that I knew how to. What the Lord began to show me, and, and this became really the theme of the trip from my point of view, when, of course, was focusing on a quite a different area. When you look at principalities, powers, and rulers of darkness, there are three templates in the Old Testament that basically deal with it. The rulers of darkness are essentially a territorial spirit. Territorial spirits have the motivation of controlling a specific geographical area. So it might be, for instance, the Gold Coast or Beanley or what, in, the, in this case, various cities in, in Uganda. 
their motivation is to control a specific geographical area, to resist the gospel, to cause as much intimidation, fear and aggravation and, and so on in that specific territorial area. The best template of that is David and Goliath. So Goliath was a champion of the Philistines. That is, he identified with the Philistines in general, but it was Goliath from Gath. So in other words, he identifies with the Philistines in general, but he is noted as the champion from a particular city called Gath. So when you start dealing with this sort of stuff and you look at David and Goliath, the heart of dealing with the territorial spirit is a covenant relationship. As David said, who's this uncircumcised Philistine? He's immediately talking about a covenant relationship. King and an army might be hiding behind the bushes, but the 15-year-old kid says, well, hang on, we are a covenant people. Uh, this land belongs to us on the basis of a blood covenant because circumcision is the seal of the Abrahamic covenant, and it was the Abrahamic covenant that gave Israel the absolute right uh, to possess the land. So territorial spirits are dealt with on the basis of a covenant relationship. Powers are entirely different. So a territorial spirits, pretty much local geographical control, a city or a town or whatever. Powers are fairly much operating on a national basis the best template in the Old Testament for that is Gideon and the Midianites. And the heart of that, even though that we tend to, there's a lot of teaching focused pretty much on the magnificent victory that he won with only 300 when he started out with 32,000. That's actually not the heart of the matter. The heart of the matter is when he actually was told and, and obeyed uh, in pulling down the altars of Baal, destroying the altars of Baal and pulling down the Asherah poles and, and and so on. So he had to deal with it spiritually long before he actually ever got to the physical battle. So powers are different and, and powers operate on a national basis and their primary motivation is not the control of territory. Uh, that's, that's territorial spirits. Powers operate basically by stripping the people of the resources. When you look at that story of, of, of uh, Gideon and the Midianites, it says Israel was impoverished. I mean, they came in without number and literally just stripped the resources and left. And, and Israel's left with nothing. It's, you know, they're living in caves and so on. So territorial spirits operate by controlling geographical area. Powers operate by stripping the people of the resources. Principalities are different again, and and powers we actually deal with by going after the, the, the spiritual strongholds and breaking down the spiritual strongholds. Principalities are different again. The best uh, best template for that is Moses dealing with Pharaoh. And the heart of dealing with Pharaoh became the blood of the Passover lamb. So these different levels of demonic control and power are recognised, they have a different motive. So the territorial spirits control the local geographical area, power strip resources, and principalities oppress the people and rob them of their destiny. And so different motivation from each level and dealt with in a different way. Territorial spirits are dealt with through covenant relationship. Powers are dealt with by breaking down spiritual strongholds and principalities are dealt with directly by the blood of the Lamb. So with that in mind, um, I, I went there to enact Jeremiah 1.10, um, knowing that it had to be done, but quite honestly, um, not having a great idea of exactly what it looked like or how to do it, um, but thinking, well... We're going to go in and go hard. And uh, hopefully there's a fair bit of grace in heaven to, to save the idiot if he does the wrong thing. So um, the first place was in a city called Ginger. Ginger sits right on the headwater of the Nile. There's Lake Victoria, um, 
there's about five different rivers flow into Lake Victoria, but only one river flowing out of it, which is the Nile, which heads north up through Sudan, Egypt, into the Mediterranean. Last year, when Gwyn and I were there, I had felt absolutely compelled to release a prophetic word up over the bank looking down on the Nile that um, there was going to be a revival start that would, as the Nile River flowed north, bringing light, natural life through North Africa, the revival was actually going to start and bring spiritual life through North Africa and ultimately cross the Mediterranean into Europe. So that word was released last year. I was back in Ginger before Gwen came, and I, I felt this this confrontation with this territorial spirit is going to happen. I'm not sure what it looks like or how it looks like, but I know it's going to happen. So I had been swapping some texts with Suzette, and um, it, it came to a head about uh, 8 o'clock one night, which was probably about, I don't know, four o'clock in the morning or something, your time. And it basically went like this, um, a little unconventional perhaps, a little going hard and in your face perhaps, but with Jeremiah 1.10 in mind, um, I was on a block of land uh, that they were going to build a church on. And, and uh, the pastor that I was with and a handful of people were up one end of the block and I walked down the other end of the block, which was about 60 metres away, by myself. And uh, I had a, a new tongue come upon me, and I started praying quite aggressively in this new tongue. I've never used it before. I've never heard it before, so it was a totally new tongue. Prayed quite aggressively in that for about three or four minutes, and then opened up and challenged the territorial spirit to its face for the city. I called him a liar and a thief, a rebel and a disgrace and challenged him to his face for the city, um, which might be a tad unconventional, but it seemed like a good idea at the time. And uh, challenged him, said, I challenge you to your face for this city, not tomorrow, not next week, here, now, tonight on this block. I challenge you to come out of the shadows and stop afflicting innocence from the shadows. I'm challenging you to your face here, now. And uh, got absolutely nothing. Not a thing. So I challenged him to his face another two or three times. Um, I mean, I thought this was probably a bit hard, bit in your face, but anyway. And uh, still got nothing. I said, look, it's easy. All you've got to do is beat the Lord of hosts, the legion of angels, and an old fat white guy from Australia. Do that and the city's yours. Uh, nothing. Not a thing. So we, we can't, one thing the Lord had impressed upon me with these territorial spirits, and this was only about the night before this took place, David took Goliath's head, and Goliath represents a ter territorial spirit. The head represents authority, but something I'd never thought of before, when you take Goliath's head, here's what you do. You shut him up, you silence his voice the voice of the territorial spirit. And Goliath had controlled the territory and sought to continue to control the territory by fear and intimidation from his voice. So taking the head, it's not just about authority, it's about silencing the voice. And the Lord had really impressed that upon me um, a couple of days or a day or so before this confrontation. So we can't... Spiritually, I mean, it's easy enough for, not easy, but uh, for David, because he's got a natural guy that he's knocked over with a rock. He can pick up a natural sword and cut the guy's head off and so on. But we've got to do spiritually what he did naturally. So we can't, I can't physically cut a demonic entity's head off, but I do know somebody who can. And, and so at that point, the challenge goes out I'm challenging you to your face for the city. Uh, you're a liar, a thief, a rebel, and a disgrace, and I'm challenging you to your face for this city right here, right now. No response, um, and but we can ask then for angelic power. Go, remove him, 
remove his voice, shut him down, take his authority, remove his voice. And in this particular case, I felt to pray that his seat will remain empty permanently as a testimony of his total total defeat and, and, and bitter defeat. So that, that kind of happened uh, that night. It, it was all over in about 15 minutes. And But the next day, you could kind of feel a shift in atmosphere in the place. It was really sort of quite, quite amazing. So long story short, um, that happened in in Tebby, which is in Tebby to you, to Kampala, is a bit like Brisbane to Ipswich. It's sort of developed completely now, anyway, but it's kind of kind of part and kind of separate. But uh, in in Tebby, then in another area called Makono, which is like a suburb of um, Kampala, and then we went on um, from there uh, to to uh, Lira. Lira was um, Lira was surprisingly um, reasonably clear in the atmosphere and not as hard as some of the other places were. But again, took the challenge there. One Sunday morning, I think it was in church, the whole church got behind it and we just challenged the territorial spirit. And and probably by that time I was getting a little bolder or whatever. I, Thing up, you know, I challenge you to your face for the city. You have two choices leave or be removed. Um, they always take the second choice. They should leave, but but they always opt for being removed. But, uh, you know, it, it might sort of sound a bit over the top or in your face, but that's what I was there for. I wasn't under an ear, I wasn't going to play games. I wasn't going to preach some nice, warm, fuzzy message. Everybody loves everyone. And, you know, new healing or whatever. They don't need me to do that. I mean, there's a ton of really good African preachers there that can, you know, preach the gospel or preach salvation or preach whatever needs to be preached. Um, I felt I was there for one reason, and that was to confront these territorial spirits, principalities, whatever the case may be. So basically I went hard and, you know, in your face and uh, probably got a little bit, I don't know whether it was bolder or sillier, uh, Pick one. It could, could be either or. But uh, by the time we sort of got to Lyra, it was like I'm challenging you to your face for this city here now. And and you have two options, leave or be removed. And they were removed, not by me personally, but by angelic forces because at that point in time, you're being challenged for the city. Um, uh, you yeah. know, here, now. And they never responded, but then we'd pray and ask for angelic forces to go, remove them, remove the authority, silence their voice, and their seat remains empty as a testimony of their, their bitter defeat. And you, when it happened, you could sense the atmosphere in the place starting to shift. I've sort of said before, and I'd had discussions with, with Gwyn, that you know, sometimes in, in Australia and other places I've been, we we focus on trying to win a ground war without ever taking control of the atmosphere. When we look back historically at um, uh, Second World War and maybe Vietnam and other places, whichever side controlled the air had a massive advantage on the ground. But a lot of churches I've been in, a lot of you know in Australia and other places, there is a tendency to try and deal with stuff on the ground without ever taking control of the atmosphere. So my, what I felt I was sent there to do, and I just went hard and, and confronted it, um, was dealing with these territorial spirits. And all, all went, went fairly well, uh, pretty much without anything seriously in the way of blowback. It was just like bang, challenge, no response, angelic forces done, and it was all over pretty quick. After this um, consecration of this bishop, Barb and I, uh, Wynne and I had been in Kampala for that, and we had both been together in Lira for about a week. We came back to Kampala for this um, consecration, but then from Kampala, Gwyn was going back to Lira, and I was on a bus with a, an African pastor going to uh, 
Gulu, which was a bit further north towards the South Sudan border, and um, a, about three hours drive from where from where Gwyn was. On the way back, uh, the bus stopped, and I looked. I didn't quite know what I was walking into in in Gulu. Um, but it was different. I had been in Gulu last year, but it was as had Gwyn. But last year was for a different purpose, not a different thing. We pulled into this bus stop, and there's about six or seven buses uh, in, in this bus stop, roadhouse, whatever you want to call it. And I looked out the window, and on the back of one of these buses, right just outside my window, this verse was written. It's Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 19. It says, And they shall fight against you, but they will not prevail against you. Uh, for I am with thee, says the Lord, to deliver thee. Went, okay, I like that. Uh, who's they? I mean, they will fight against you. I mean, is it ministries who don't want to accept the message? Is it churches? Is it people? Is it demonic? Or what is it? I wasn't too sure, but I certainly liked the scripture because it said, and they will fight against you, but they will not prevail against thee, for I am with thee to deliver thee, says the Lord. So I was pretty encouraged by that going into Gulu. And as we got into Gulu, I felt this voice say to me, you've just walked into the dragon's lair. Went, okay. I thought, well, I didn't take a lot of notice of it, to be honest. I thought, well, that all sounds a bit melodramatic. You've just walked into the dragon's lair, but whatever, I'm here anyway, so, yeah, whatever. Um, but they will fight against you, they'll not prevail, you've just stepped into the dragon's lair. And I think I was probably a bit, I don't know, had let my guard down a bit because I'd challenged about four of these things before without much in the way of resistance. As the bus came into Gulu, it was like it was from Joshua 6, 1 or whatever, we are. Jericho is straightly shut up. I mean, it was like driving into a concrete wall in the spirit. Gulu was a town, I don't know what the population would be, maybe 100,000, 150,000 or something. But, but it was like, you know, whoa. I mean, unlike all these other places which had been relatively open, Gulu was like this place is in hard, hard, hard lockdown. I mean, spiritually, it was like it was locked solid. And uh, I, I said to the Lord, I said, well, because, I mean, it was radically different to where I'd been before. And I said, what, what do you want me to do? And he said, do what I told you to do. I'm, okay. So that was on a Wednesday. Wednesday. Late Wednesday, I didn't have a meeting that night. The next night, I did a, he a meeting that was focused primarily on healing. Then on the Friday, they took me on the Friday night, and bearing in mind by this time, this is the sixth week, I was just staggeringly, stunningly tired because I'd been ministering and traveling virtually every day for six weeks. And Friday night, they took me to administrate an all-night prayer meeting and I was there from midnight till six o'clock in the morning got back to where I was staying about half past six seven in the morning and it had tipped me over the edge fatigue wise I was just absolutely stunningly tired I got up at about midday and had to go and do another meeting in midday and walked into a sucker punch from a fairly strong demon um, I will try to dodge that bullet again in future because it was less than pleasant. Um, did this meeting and and I was incredibly tired, but it was a it was more of a Bible study than than a preach, and it was an easy teach on a subject that I was familiar with. And because of tiredness, I thought, oh, I, I can do this easy enough, and I, I was just sort of all, almost in cruise control. And uh, I was in the front of the church, and there's about 25 people in front of me, opened in prayer, and there was a young girl, when I say young girl, she's 18, 22 or 3 or something, something like that, uh, over on the side, and as I opened in prayer, she just fell out of a chair. She's a bonk. 
and and I should have been more aware. I should have been on my guard or whatever, but I was just stunningly tired. And uh, so I finished opening and prayer. What's going on there? I walked over, and she's sort of on her back and looked up at me. I say looked in the loosest possible sense. Both eyes were completely rolled back. There was no pupil, no um, no visible eye, just the white on both eyes. And, and it was exacerbated by a very dark black face. So this is this black face looking at me with two completely white eyes, a head rolled over a bit and this black ink fluid came out of her mouth. And uh, I sort of stepped back a bit and literally as I stepped back, this quite strong demon came at me. And, and demons have, basically they want to either A, completely destroy the meeting, distract, you know, el eliminate the meeting. And if they can't do it by distraction, then they will do it by attacking you personally. And the attack is normally in thinking what, what you're trying to preach, share, put together, whatever, and it comes in like confusion, uncertainty, losing track of what you're trying to think of and whatever. So I, I shut it down because I'd learned the hard way in India uh, about 20 years ago. Uh, don't engage with it now because all it will do is put on a show and, and you'll just lose, lose the meeting. So I shut it down, went to walk back over to the meeting. And, I mean, like fr from here to the door, I didn't have a clue what it was that I was going to preach or share. or And it was like it was a complete confusion and trying to recall what it was I was going to say or do or whatever. Battled through that for about 10 minutes, got the meeting done, went back at the end of the meeting and prayed for this girl. No bells and buzzers, no great move of God, nothing, you know, nothing that you'd you know, go, wow, uh, just prayed for her. And went home that night. It was a Saturday night. I was already stunningly tired and I had three meetings to do on Sunday, two back-to-back -back and one a bit later in the afternoon. I woke up a few times during the night and said, Lord, remember that girl. I want her back in the meeting. I want her saved and delivered. And she came back. I, I did the third. They have five meetings on a, on a Sunday. I did the third, the fourth, and and the sixth, the fifth, third, fourth, and fifth. Um, she came back to the third meeting. I was sitting up near the pulpit waiting to preach, and I saw her walking towards me. She came over, and her eyes were completely clear, and her face had changed, and, and she was basically completely delivered. She came back to the fourth meeting and the fifth meeting. And just came back, and every time she came back, she just looked better and better. Mm -hmm. And then on the Monday, I had another meeting, and I went to her after the meeting, and she thanked me, and, and her eyes were just completely clear. Her face was shining. It was like, thank you, Jesus. Mm -hmm. Total, totally and completely set free. But I did wear a bit of the blowback from it. I On, on Sunday, by the time I'd sort of done this all night or on, Friday night, the, the Saturday meeting, then three meetings on Sunday. I was just warped out of my skull tide. But I, I fairly rapidly developed a really high fever, excruciating headache, and just started getting sicker and sicker, um, which I'd probably just walk. When I, when I walked over to see what was wrong in the first place, I should have been more alert. I should have been on guard. I should have, should have, would have, could have. Uh, but I was just tired. And on the Sunday night, I started getting sick. Monday, I was just headachy and high fever. And I, I didn't take a lot of notice of it. Um, I thought I was just fatigue and a bit of dehydration or whatever. Um, Monday night, I didn't sleep and I wound up with a huge fever. And I got out of bed and I was just lying on the cold tiles on the floor, just, just trying to cool off. I, mean, I felt like I was on fire. Tuesday, um, I had to go back to where Gwyn was and I was just tired and fatigued and sick and just 
I, as soon as I got back, I, I went to bed and then he got home about one o'clock in the morning and uh, I, I was in pretty bad shape by then. Uh, I had excruciating headache, really high fever, and I don't think I've ever felt so sick in my life. But as, as bad as it was, I had an absolute miracle recovery. So for those people who were praying and, and Gwen prayed for me, thank you very much. Because I literally, it peaked about three or four o'clock in the morning. And I, had I been at home, I would have been in hospital. Um, no two ways about it. I mean, I was incredibly sick, but I mean, you know, you're there in an African town, so I'm not going to pursue that option. Um, I literally crawled across the bedroom floor to, to get to the toilet then to be sick and then crawled back across the bedroom floor and propped up against the wall. And I got, I, I, I was just, I've never been so sick and in so much pain in my life. And I, it was about four o'clock in the morning and I said to Gwen, look, you're going to have to pray for me to do something. And uh, he came and laid hands on me and prayed for me. And there would have been people praying at home too. And within about an hour, hour and a half, the fever broke. I dozed off to sleep, woke up two or three hours later. Fever's gone, the headache's gone, and I'm actually feeling all right. And I, I drank a fair bit of water, which Gwyn had some hydrolyte or something in it as well. So I drank about a litre of water because I, I was just sweating, like just turning the bed into a, a saturated mess. And the fever had gone, the headache had gone. I was actually feeling half all right. Drank about a litre of this water, went back to sleep, woke up about three hours later and I was about 80% right. So I went from four o'clock in the morning, like a hospital case, never been so sick in my life, to by one o'clock I was sitting at the lunch table having something to eat and drink. So, I, I mean, it was literally a, a, a medical miracle. Um, so thank God for, for the, the prayer and the support and whatever, which is which was um, hugely... Uh, beneficial but it was a pretty amazing trip um, I, I stepped into some uh, I guess territory and confrontation uh, that I haven't done before however uh, I'd do it again in a heartbeat to get the same result and particularly for that girl that first looked up with the white eyes uh, if I went to again for nothing else but her it's worth the entire trip it's worth the entire trip just for her um, all things being equal at this stage, we'll probably go back in uh, July next year. Let me just finish off quickly with this. While in Uganda, uh, we the build and to plant, we were going hard at pulling down demonic strongholds, but at the same time building spiritual identity and, and kingdom position and so on into the people and also preaching on revival. So you want to rip one thing down, but if you if you try to rip something down, you also want to replace it with something. You don't, don't leave a vacuum there. There's three areas scripturally that we're looking at that focus on revival, and these things apply regardless of, of where you happen to be. None of them, none of the three things, particularly focus on prayer, surprisingly enough. Now, that's by no means to, to diminish the value of prayer because obviously there's a lot of prayer needs to go into stuff in the background and so on. But the specific instances don't necessarily relate directly to prayer. One of them is Ezekiel 37, the Valley of Dry Bones. Now, in part, that was fulfilled when they came back out of captivity. The greatest fulfillment of Ezekiel 37 was in when Israel became a nation again in 1948. But they've gone from the Valley of Dry Bones, which the bones are just scattered across the valley. There's no identity. There's no substance. There's no unity. There's nothing. Everything has been lost. And the complete restoration and revival comes from the prophetic word of God in the mouth of a man. Now, God himself could have spoken into the, the valley and, you know, had it resurrected and back on track in an instant. But he chose to use his word in the mouth of a man or a woman. So the first major revival there 
comes out of the word of God, the prophetic word of God in the mouth of a man speaking into the valley of dry bones. The second one is the story of Lazarus being raised from the dead. I mean, that's a pretty good revival. The guy is dead and he's in the grave and he stinks. Uh, in chapter 11 of John's gospel, in chapter 12, he's sitting at the uh, supper table with Jesus. That's a pretty good revival. The focus of Lazarus being raised from the dead is rolling the stone away. No stone rolled away, no resurrection. So the, the focal point of Lazarus being raised, I mean, Jesus saying Lazarus come forth and so on, but the real heart there is rolling the stone away. Many years ago, I was preaching in Trinidad and I preached on Lazarus and came back to the accommodation. The Lord spoke to me, said, look, if, if rolling the stone away works for an individual, would it work for a city or a nation? And I said, um, I don't know. And he said, well, what, what does rolling the stone away mean? I don't know. Um, felt like doing an Ezekiel down there, Lord. Um, but um, he said, rolling the stone away is symbolic of repentance. If a city would repent or a nation would repent, you could have revival like that. So symbolically, um, rolling the stone away from the front of Lazarus's grave represents repentance. So there's one revival hinges upon the prophetic word of God in the mouth of a man. The next one, the focal point is repentance. The third one is the woman with the issue of blood. So here comes this woman who uh, is slowly dying. Um, she's completely healed and made whole. And when she's healed and made whole, she now has the ability to reproduce, which she didn't have when she had the, 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 the issue of blood. But the focal point there is touching the hem of the garment. So we've got three different revivals and restorations. One is focused on the prophetic word in the mouth of a man. The next one is focused on repentance. And the third one is touching the hem of the garment. Now, the hem of the garment that she touched was the mantle that actually had a tassel in each corner, which was white with a thread of blue through it. And white represents purity and truth, and that royal blue colour represents the Holy Spirit. So in point of fact, what it represents symbolically is worshipping in spirit and truth. So you, you've got three stories, basically, of revival and restoration there. One is based on the prophetic word of God in the mouth of a man, One's based on repentance, and the other one's based on worship in spirit and truth. Oddly enough, none of the three are specifically related to by prayer, not to suggest for a moment that there's not a lot of prayer and so on has gone into the background. But when we look at I mean, everyone wants revival. I mean, I want revival in Uganda. We want revival here. But sometimes we've got to learn something from it and say, okay, well, scripturally, where and how does this revival happen and can we learn something from previous templates that we can employ now and optimistically get a similar result? And if we look at the power of words, the power of repentance, and the power of worship in spirit and truth, and uh, I'm quite sure if we do that, and going back to what I had said at the start, our purpose in church is not to preach, it's not to fellowship or whatever and we can do all of those things all those things were good but our primary purpose in the ecclesia is to prepare a place to welcome the presence of god ultimately nothing else matters if we can do that successfully if we can come together and prepare a place to welcome the presence of god everything else will be okay but if we miss that point and we are focused on whatever else it is that we've, we've got in mind or to do or whatever, then we miss the primary point, and that's always to prepare a place for the presence of God. So thanks for your time and patience. hope that uh, was a bit of a blessing. Oh, thank you very much for your support and prayer uh, on the trip. I kid you not, uh, the prayer backing makes a huge difference, particularly when you've got people going, wandering around, challenging demonic spirits for the for the city. Um, so <laughs> seemed like a good idea at the time. <laughs> I, I, I felt 
I mean, truly, when I'm standing in the dark on the end of this block of land, and I mean, I'm just doing what I felt led to do at the time. You know, I challenge you to your face for this city, not tomorrow, not here, now on this block tonight. I'm challenging you to your face for this city. All you got to do is beat the Lord of hosts, a legion of angels, and an old fat white guy from Australia and the city is yours. Can't do that. You could have a bit of trouble. But uh, praise God, I, I did walk into a bit of blowback from that uh, encounter with that girl, but uh, as sick as I was, quite frankly, I'd do it again in a heartbeat to get the same result. Uh, because if it was for the sake of that girl from where she was on the floor initially with just white eyes and this black ink coming out of her mouth to where she stood completely delivered and set free three days later, um, I'd do it again in a heartbeat just for her.